Sure. So now, let us proceed with our first keynote presentation. It is my honor to introduce Ms. Misozi Ziwela, the Senior Advisor of US Aid Checkup One program at PEC Zambia. She has, her, she has spent her career supporting and empowering mm -hmm. young girls who are vulnerable to HIV and AIDS, but at the same time, she's particularly experienced in managing the DREAMS program implemented through the US President Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or known as PEPFAR. Without Further ado, I invite her to the podium to give her keynote presentation on youth economy empowerment. The podium is yours. Morning. Oh, I'm audible. Morning, everyone. Morning. Um, I love presenting first because I know everyone is wide awake. We've had our coffees. Um, and Jeremy also checked in to make sure that not anyone got drunk last night. So I think we're in good spirits. Um, so I've already been introduced. My name is Misozi, and I'm excited to be here this morning um, to speak about a topic that I'm personally very passionate about. It is a topic that affects all of us in one way or another, but of course our focus um, of this workshop is our adolescents and young women. So I'll be speaking to economic empowerment, and I think we can talk about this all day. Um, so squeezing it into 20 minutes was a difficult task to do. Um, but I think the objective of the presentation is really just to give a snapshot, provide evidence of what's working, where we need to do better, and also just to present a few models so that we can learn. So I won't spend too much time on the background because I think yesterday set um, a good tone. A lot of data was shared, a lot of statistics, and I love what was mentioned in the opening remarks that we don't need to justify why we're here. We all understand the importance. Um, but on this slide, maybe I'll just want to highlight that transactional and intergenerational sex, child marriage, sexual gender-based violence, poverty, and lack of access to health remain key drivers of HIV amongst young people. When we look particularly on adolescent girls and young women, they're also vulnerable to HIV due to lack of access to um, education. I think my colleague will be speaking about that in more detail, as well as systematic exclusion from economic opportunities. So when you talk about economic vulnerability, um, we do, I think we'd all agree that it does increase HIV risk. So economic status has long been recognized as a structural driver of HIV, and adolescents and young people um, face several um, obstacles such as low literacy and financial knowledge, limited ac access to financial services, as well as lack of social capital. When we look at um, the HIV cascade and we talk about treatment, for example, economic vulnerability also inhibits access to services such as PrEP and ART, um, as well as um, in inhibits, uh, I mean, it also contributes to the poor adherence. Um, most of these challenges I've mentioned cut across various uh, subpopulations, such as the young key populations. We had our colleagues speak to us via video on the challenges that they're facing in terms of access to um, to healthcare. For adolescents and young women as well, um, economic inse insecurity reduces negotiating power in their sexual relationships and also increases their reliance on transactional and sex work. So I think what, I, what I, we heard a lot yesterday was evidence. What is our data showing us? What are our programs speaking to? So when we look at economic strengthening and HIV and SRH outcomes, there's no magic bullet point for HIV prevention. However, various interventions have proven that multi-layered interventions do promote um, or address economic factors. When we look at household economic strengthening interventions, for example, there are studies that have shown that SRH and HIV outcomes have been achieved um, across prevention treatment as well as care. So for example, cash transfers. Just to mention, I'm not here to spark debate. <laughs> I'm not here to share what I voted for either yesterday. Um, but there are studies that have proven that cash transfers reduce HIV risk behaviors. Um, additionally, cash transfers, and when you add on food assistance, have also improved ART adherence and retention to care. And financial incentives enhance access to HIV testing services and linkage to care. So I'll speak to studies. I can't talk without. Um, so this data that I've just shared um, can be backed up by three particular studies that I would like to speak to this morning. The first one is the DFID-funded Adolescent Girls Empowerment Program, which was implemented between 2012 and 2016 in Zambia, and it had a theory of change. 
So what was trying to be addressed is that if adolescent girls and are empowered by building their social health and economic assets, they will increase the likelihood of completing school, delaying sexual debut, and reducing risk of early marriage, an intended pregnancy, acquisition of HIV, and other possible detrimental outcomes. So what were the interventions? These adolescents were enrolled into safe spaces where they were provided with HIV prevention education as well as counseling. In addition to that, they were provided with health, health vouchers, um, which promoted easy access to health um, services. So they had access to both private and public health facilities anytime they wish to, though somebody readily available to attend to them and provide them various services. In addition to that, a certain cohort, because this was a study, a certain cohort was provided um, financial literacy education and through private sector engagement, they were linked to formal banking. Um, so what did the results show at the end of the four years? So some of the key outcomes were achieved, such as an increase in SRH knowledge, as well as savings behavior. And another one which is very important to note is that there was a reported decrease in transactional sex at the end of the four years. However, not all of the anticipated outcomes were achieved, such as pregnancy, condom use, and gender attitudes. So what this shows us is that the pathway to change is complex, and it's based on a combination of economic health and social factors. One of the key findings from this study was also that household economic bar barriers need to be more holistically addressed in adolescent health programming. For example, through cash transfers. Again, I'm not sharing what I voted for yesterday, <laughs> but I think we're, there's a message that's coming across here. So an example of one of the models that has proven to work is a cash plus in Tanzania. I won't speak to what cash transfers are. I think that was well um, discussed yesterday, but I want to talk about the plus aspect of it. So what this model is speaking to is that in addition to providing cash transfers to these households, they did layer additional services um, for the participants. So for example, they offered mentoring and productive grants, livelihoods and life skills training, as well as youth-friendly SRH services. What did the results show? A 21% increase in HIV testing, 67% reduction in sexual violence, which is quite significant as well as a 5% increase in knowledge and modern contraception use, and a 7% increase in HIV knowledge. So what we're seeing here is that when you offer cash transfers and additionally layer other services, you do actually achieve HIV and SRH outcomes. Um, and lastly, I'd like to speak to the PEPFA Dreams Initiative. I was excited yesterday to share notes with um, colleagues from Mozambique, from South Africa, from Zimbabwe, who are also implementing dreams or at least are knowledgeable about the program. Um, so what this model is doing is combining multi-layered services to the adolescent girls and young women. I like to call that little girl Misozi, who's in the center of that image. Um, so she's a 15, 16 year old adolescent enrolled on the program. And once she's enrolled, she has access to multiple services that are listed on this slide worth mentioning HIV testing services, family planning, PrEP, which was spoken about yesterday, economic empowerment, mental health, um, as well as fin um, support to education. In addition to that, the boys are not left behind. So DREAMS has incorporated several interventions, such as the coaching boys into men, um, that also creates a safe space for the boys. I think yesterday the message that was put across is that the boys also want a platform to talk, the boys and young men. Um, so as DREAMS is focusing on these vulnerable adolescent girls by providing all the multiple layers of services, the sexual partners, the brothers, um, all the males in the household are also achieved through specific interventions. In addition to that, the community and the family are not left behind. There's also a parenting program um, that also teaches HIV prevention and sexual gender-based violence to the parents of the girls who are enrolled on the program. So it's a very, very comprehensive model which combines biomedical, behavioral, and structural interventions. Um, so since we're talking about economic empowerment this morning, I just want to draw attention to 
one of the five PEPFAR approved models for DREAMS, which is the Siaka Girls. I know um, different countries have selected different economic empowerment models to work with, and there's no time to speak about all of them. Um, but when you look at Siaka, it's basically a bridge to employment model where these young women aged between 15 and 24 are enrolled into the program and then additionally screened. Um, so they're taken through various stages. As you can see, it's more or less like a pathway where they're offered foundational skills training, tailored vocational training, workplace focused social asset training, as well as linkages to internship. And at the end of the day, we want to see these young women graduate either into full-time employment or as successful entrepreneurs. So Siaka on Dreams in Zambia was piloted a year ago, and we've seen great results so far. Over 20,000 young women have been trained in financial literacy just in the space of a year. Um, and in terms of savings groups, over 17,000 are participating in savings with a cumulative savings of 392,000 um, US dollars. And uh, regards engagement into business, 11% um, of those who are saving are successfully um, running their own businesses. So what this model promotes is um, supporting those young women already with businesses, but who need additional um, support to make their businesses successful. 330 um, young women have been reported to be formally employed um, through support from the program and through this model. So just to share some of the key lessons learned and recommendations, and I think a lot of them were spoken um, to yesterday. If more involvement of adolescents and young people is very key when designing and monitoring projects. Livelihoods interventions must also be very comprehensive in design, and they should address household level barriers. Another uh, recommendation or key lesson learned is that economic barriers negatively influence adolescent programs. And there's also a need to build more evidence linking economic strengthening programs to HIV and SRH outcomes. So just to speak to that, um, the DREAMS intervention, for example, and I think we echoed the same um, thought with a lot of colleagues from across different DREAMS countries. There's no formal study um, that has been conducted to link um, outcomes such as livelihoods to HIV and SRH. But we do know that there is an opportunity because the project will be running um, for the next five years. Um, so we're hoping under the leadership of Dr. Zuzu, who is in front of me, that we, we should be able to conduct certain studies that can build evidence um, to see what's working. Is the layered approach working? Uh, can we provide evidence that we're linking HIV and SRH outcomes to these comprehensive livelihood models? We also need to ensure that broader country level policies actually support the work that we're doing. And lastly, it's important to conduct market assessments. Even as we provide linkages to vocational skills training or to internships, we need to understand what's the country context, what businesses are profitable. So it's very important to also scan the market. So I'll end with a key message to the adolescents in the room. Um, and this is simply to say the development field more than ever before is focused on empowering adolescents to be at the helm of designing, implementing, and monitoring services. Please get involved and be the change that you want to see. And I know this was echoed even yesterday. And I have shared a few resources um, that personally I find um, very helpful when we're looking at economic empowerment um, related to adolescents. So Dreams has social media pages where you can access information. The Population Council also has an adolescent data hub where you can look up different researches, what has worked, um, what studies are currently going, and what evidence we're trying to build. Also our local CSOs, I know we have grassroots soccer, for example, um, participating in this workshop, um, but our local CSOs, networks, and as well as our local governments are also good resources when it comes to um, getting more information and involving ourselves. So Zikomo, thank you so much. And I look forward to interacting more. Like I've said, we can not talk about livelihoods in 20 minutes, um, but I think we have a great opportunity to informally chat and also view several abstracts that are speaking to the same. So thank you so much.